So this is pre-calc section 4.7. Okay, the last few days we've been working on graphing. And the graphing that we've been working on, sine, cosine, and uh, cosecant, secant, cotangent, and tangent, I'm hoping that they're all straight up. Uh, Friesen, we had talked today, you said something was wrong. Cotangent goes from 0 to pi, and tangent goes from negative pi over 2 to negative, to positive pi over 2. So that's, those were right, those were assignment things. I checked that today. So just to make sure, you made that comment as we were talking this morning. I thought I'd check to make sure I didn't screw something up. Okay, sorry, it was about our conversation this morning. Okay, uh, for the rest of y'all, we're looking at 4.7. And we're really talking about, in 4.7, inverses and why it's defined the way they are. Okay, so inverses are defined a different, uh, particular way. And it's because of the graphs not passing the vertical line test, or better yet, horizontal line test. I want you to think about what we did with sine. If I'm talking about a sine graph, if I start here, I'm going like this. Great for vertical line tests, no problem. It's a function, but horizontally, oops. Okay, it doesn't have a one-to-one -one correspondence, you know, because it passes horizontal and vertical line tests. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence when we're talking about its inverse, because I can reflect it across the y equal x line, no problem. It fails here, though, right? So its inverse is not a function. If I talk about cosine, its inverse is not a function. Okay? Are you okay with that? The inverse of cosines, not a function. The inverse of sines, not a function. Think about tangent. Would its inverse be a function? Because when we're talking about tangent, I'm going to do that on a separate uh, grid. If I look at tangent, and we have this, and we start started talking about our asymptotes here, and we keep pushing that along, we have our zeros, but then it comes up like this, and it comes up like this, and it fails the vertical, the it passes the vertical line test, but it fails the horizontal line test. It, its inverse cannot be a function. But yet, you guys were able to tell me if I told you that the sine of an angle was one half, you could find the undo. You could use the inverse of one half and know that that's a 30 degree angle or it's pi over six. Okay, no problem. So we're going to talk about the restrictions that are placed on the function in order for the inverse to work, okay? And I don't want you to get too worked up about it. We're gonna talk about something called the principle of value range, PVR, if I ever like, you know, shortcut it. And it's going to be the, the range in which we are working in the function to make the inverse actually work and be a function so we can use it in our calculator. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to understand the restricted domains and ranges of inverse trig functions. And the only three we're going to work on is sine, cosine, and tangent. Okay. We're going to evaluate inverse trig functions. And that's going to take probably, we'll do part of it today. We'll do a lot of it tomorrow and day three. Composed trig functions and inverse trig functions, the composing, decomposing is kind of a fun thing. And that's something you'll definitely use in calculus A, B, and B, C. But the, and then we'll apply inverse trig functions, okay? So it's about inverse trig functions. It's about the stuff we've been working on. I'm just gonna make sure I get to the bottom without uh, skipping stuff. Now, a quick review of trig functions. Um, the trig functions are inputs and their outputs. Remember, sine, cosine, tangent, all take an angle value in. The, the relationship. Um, we have already had a little experience with the inverse trig functions. And the biggest one is if sine theta is equal to 5 over 7. Okay, So let's talk about that. If I go between 0 and 360, I want to talk about it. But I also want to make sure that you realize that this is an angle. Okay. This is a ratio, okay? Our sine, cosine, tangent takes an angle into its argument and shoots out a ratio, okay? And you got to keep in mind, you've got to be thinking that this is going to give me a ratio when I'm working on it. 
and that's, that ratio is 5 over 7. So that's opposite over hypotenuse. If I'm thinking about this, I have a positive sign. I have a positive sign here, and this isn't going to be drawn to scale, so you know, use your imagination, pretend it is, all right? But if this is 7, and that's 7, and this is 5, and this is 5, both these sketches fit for sign because sine's positive. And anything above the x-axis is a positive value for my sine value. Are you okay with that? I've got people looking. Are there any questions about why I'm doing what I'm doing? I didn't get told that I'm looking for it between in quadrant one. I didn't get told I'm looking for it in quadrant two, three, or four. I just said, hey, somewhere around zero to 360 is the answer here. Now, if I'm looking at this here, I'm thinking that I have a really good chance of coming up with a theta. This is my theta. Okay, you all right with that? But this is theta as well. This is the same theta, but this is like theta 2. Okay, this is theta 1, this is theta 1, because those are my reference triangles. Are you okay with those reference triangles? My reference angle in quadrant 1 would be the same angle in out here in quadrant 2, okay, as a reference triangle angle. But my other angle, my theta 2, I have to consider because to get out here to measure from my standard position, what's that angle going to be as well? We know some stuff, okay? And if I look at this algebraically, if we use my skills from geometry, okay, you can be geometry man or woman, okay, and we can put them in. So we got the inverse. Well, first of all, if I have sine of theta equal 5 sevenths, I can use the inverse function, the inverse function like this, and I'm just going to show that that's what I'm doing. And I'm going to find the inverse of 5 over 7 in my calculator. Okay, this is in there too. Okay, because that inverse, if I take the inverse of the sine, I just get theta. Okay, because I take a an an angle in the sine, and that creates a ratio. That same ratio from sine inverse gives me my angle, my theta angle. Well, this is going to be theta 1. Okay, so put that in your calculator real quick. Make sure in degrees, we're in degrees on this one, okay? And be, get used to working back and forth between degrees and... Radius says, or radians, I should say. Yep. We're taking the inverse sine of both sides. We're taking the inverse. This is the function we're working with, and I'm taking the inverse sine of both sides. In doing so, I get this inverse sine. This is 45. 0.585 degrees. Are you okay with the value that you got? Now remember, that is my first quadrant. This is in quadrant one. Okay. Does that make sense? Now that other sketch is in quadrant two. So that quadrant two sketch was really because theta one is 45. Point 585 degrees, I've got to subtract from 180 at 45.585 degrees and come up with my 134.415 degrees, the other degree for that angle. Now here's my issue. If it's a function, the same input should not create two outputs that are different, right? So we have a problem here. Your calculator already knows that this is the answer. You just found that. Okay. There is a principal value range that sign is defined on. Okay. That we use predominantly in order to find inverses. And 
we've got to know why it is and we got to know how to work with it and realize what type of information we're getting from our calculator when we're getting it okay so that's what we're going to do on this next part portion we've got two answers and honestly I could do infinitely many if I keep doing rotations if I keep going keep going I could just keep more and more on So we're going to talk about the restrictions that the inverse sine, or what we're going to learn it as is arc sine, they're synonymous, we're going to flip back and forth between them, and talk about why we have those restrictions, okay? Now, there was a group that got together and they had this meeting about how to make the restrictions so it was consistent all the way across the board, all right? So, and part of this, when we're doing this, we have to we have to have our inverse one to one, and right now it's not. We we don't have our reflection across the x y the y equal x line one to one when we're working with our sine function. The six basic trig functions, being periodic, failed the horizontal line test rather spectacularly you know, because it's just keeps crossing over and over and over all the time. However, since they are so important, we look for a restricted domain where they will be one to one, thus allowing us to work with inverse functions. Okay, and your calculator is already loaded with those inverse functions. So the domain that must have been shown shows a one-to-one -one interval. Okay, so we know that the original function and its inverse, okay, the reflection are one-to-one, -one, which means it passes the horizontal and vertical line tests. We take on all y values of the trig function. So we can't just say, oh yeah, we can't, uh, we can't do that particular ratio because that doesn't exist. So we have to fit them all. And then we have to be convenient can't be like way out in left, left field when we're doing it. We have to kind of know what's going on with it. So when we're looking at it, if we sketch the sine function, and remember sine starts on the axis, it goes high, it goes back to the axis, it goes low, and back to the axis, and we can like flip this around. So I've got this function going on like this. So that's my sine, it keeps going right? When we're looking at an interval, there are a lot of choices to be picking, but I've got to ask this one. What's the principal branch of tangent? When we did our tangent, if I'm going to do a phase shift, what do we restrict tangent between? Negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Well, between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 is the restriction that they put on for sine. And folks are like, why is that? If we are looking at the unit circle from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, you got to keep in mind that sine is positive up here, but it's negative down here. And this allows us to see all the possible sine values there are if we do it between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay? It also allows us to see all the tangents there are, and you'll notice that we'll go between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 for tangent as well. Okay, So the freak in this is going to be cosine because it can go from 0 to pi. And we, we're upset for cosine, but it makes sense because when I'm in quadrants 1 and 4, what are my cosine values? Are they positive or negative? Are you okay that all the cosine values between quadrants 1 and 4 are always positive? So we don't fulfill the requirement of having all values taken care of. So that's why we have to, for cosine, go 0 to pi. For sine, all the values for sine are in the range from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, both positive and negative signs. That's why we're defining this this way. So with that idea, when I'm looking at this, if I do my reflection, I've got this going on, and it's going to come around like this, okay? So I reflected my sign across the y equal um, x line, and that's what it's going to look like. We are talking about, and when I reflect it, I also reflect my values. And I'm going to put pi over 2 up here so it doesn't look confusing. And I've got negative 1 here and 1 here, okay? So I reflected my axis, too. Does that make sense? I'm reflecting 
across the y equal x line, not only my axis, because if I reflect my axis, where this is uh, pi over 2, and remember this is 1, and this is negative 1, when I reflect it across the y equal x line, my axis is will flip. So I've reflected this across my y equal x line. So this is the inverse, the inverse of sine, which is me reflecting it across the y equal x line between the values from my original sine cos my original sine function between the values of negative pi over two and pi over two. But now because those are horizontal in the reflection, they are my vertical coordinates. And because the vertical coordinates were one and negative one, they are now the horizontal coordinates when I'm working with them, okay, in my reflection over the y equal x line, okay? Now, you guys worked with this y equal x line uh, reflection in geometry, and uh, coordinates switch their positions, okay? And that's how you learned how to deal with those. But when we're talking about this, I just want to make sure I filled in everything I've got going. We're talking about our interval, and our interval is included. It's uh, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay, and that's that's where this is coming from, that negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. That's where it's defined as my inverse function for sine, okay? If I do anything more, it will fail the horizontal line test because it will start going back and it will cross that line a second time. Now, with that said, you've got to know where this is. This is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So it's along this area in my unit circle, okay? And I know I get carried away and I, I forget that I put this picture in there already. Okay, but so my PVR is a half moon, that principal value range, PVR, um, is in quadrants one and two. And we're talking about this here. Is This is what the inverse sine function function looks like. Because remember, the sign would keep going around like this, like that, and if I continued with that, I'd fail the horizontal, the vertical line test now, aka the horizontal line test before I reflected it. Now it's the vertical line test, and it would fail if I continue allowing sign to do what it normally does. That's why we have restricted sign to this area. It's in a little playpen, and that's as far as it can go. Yes, sir? First and the fourth, yes, you're right. I said second, and I should be fourth, so thanks for calling me on it. Okay, so it's first and fourth. Now, my domain and what we just did. Okay, so I've got y equals inverse sine of x, or what you're going to see it as, y equals arc sine of x. They're interchangeable. Okay, uh, and when we're going through this, in my domain, remember, negative 1 to 1. My principal value range, as we're looking this over, I've got negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay, now I want to make sure that this is right for you. The inverse sign takes a ratio value in, okay? And I don't care what it looks like. The inverse function takes a ratio in. The ratio has got to be between negative 1 and 1. Otherwise, it don't work. And you can check it. Put in the inverse of sine and put in 10 and find out what your calculator does. Just go ahead and do it. Okay? I want to make sure you guys realize that message you'll get from your calculator. So try this. Take the inverse of sine and put in 10. And hit enter. Error, right? It freaks out on you. It's because it's outside this principal value range, domain, negative 1 to 1. And if you think about it, what's the largest sign is on the unit circle? What's the largest sign value we get? We get a half. We get square root of 2 over 2. We get square root of 3 over 2. All of them are, you know, square root of 3 over 2 is like 0 0.8666, halves 0.5, okay, and we get 1. 
and then we start going back to negative 0.8666. We start to square to 2 over 2, which is like 0.77, and then we go to half, and then we go to 0, and then we go all the way down to negative 1. But we never go beyond negative 1 and 1 for sine, nor do we do that for tangent. You will never have a value, a ratio value, for sine or cosine that's greater than 1 or smaller than negative 1. Okay? So you got to keep in mind that ratio is a significant piece of information that we're working with. So that's why we have this domain on it. If you're trying to put something outside the domain into an inverse or arc sine or arc cosine, it, your calculator won't work for you. Okay, but the principal value range, remember, what you get out, okay, of the function should be an angle. And in this case, it's going to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 because we've restricted that domain to be between negative 1 and 1. Now, the stuff that I just talked about is the stuff that's right there, okay? Matter of fact, you should put, talk about the principal value range, PVR. And now how are we going to use this stuff? You've used it. You've done it. I just showed you why your calculator returns. And the reason why we haven't worried about it before is because when you were a geometry student, you always worked with the values in quadrant one. That was it. It went from zero to 90. You worked with uh, acute angles. Okay? I didn't have to talk about it. So here, when we're talking about this, the angles are between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, whose sine is x. Okay? Now, remember, ratios go in, an angle comes out, okay? So let's talk about this one, evaluation. Find the exact value of each expression, each expression without a calculator. Hopefully you're remembering your unit circle, okay? And if you're not so sure about it, draw a little sketch, kind of get yourself going. I got one half, okay? Sine being one half, it's got to be positive. Okay, and since the principal value range is this moon between negative pi over and pi over 2, I'm looking right there. Well, that's where the square root of 3 over 2 is my cosine. My sine is 1 half, and I'm talking about pi over 6. Okay, so that's where I'm talking, my pi over 6. And they don't tell me that it's got to be in radians, do they? So that's akin to being 30 degrees. Are you okay with that? Any questions about what I did? You take your ratio, okay, and you find your angle value. And in this case, your angle value's got to be in your principal value range, and it always will be. We might have to work it back into the principal value range, and I'll show you what that means. Now, negative square root of 3 over 2. Remember, this is normally what we do. Negative square root of 3 over 2 is down here. And also down here, it's negative square root of 3 over 2. Yes, sir. Pi over 6. This is sine. No, you would not. Sine of 1 half is not pi over 6. This inverse sine of 1 half is pi over 6. Remember, pi over 6 is a, uh, a degree measure. Not a degree, but an angle measure. I should say it that way. And 30 degrees is also an angle measure. Okay, so those are two angle measures. Your sine value takes in the pi over 6, and it shoots out your ratio value. Okay, it also, if I use it in degree it'll show out your ratio value. This is the undo, okay? I have a ratio. What angle did that come from? Okay, and that's what the inverse does. That inverse function, okay, is the thing that takes a ratio in and it gives you the angle value, okay? So that's why I can take the sides of a triangle and based on it being opposite over a hypotenuse, I can put that into sine, because that's the ratio it'll take in, and I can find the angle that is made there, okay? And so this is an angle that comes out that we're talking about. 
whether it's radians or degrees. They don't tell me here, so I'm doing both, okay, in this case. Now, in letter B, I have an opportunity to talk about which one's going to come back. And because my principal value range is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, and both of these are negative square root of 3 over 2s, I am going to get this value out, okay, my negative pi over 3, okay, not my negative 2 pi over 3, because negative pi over 3 is inside sine inverse's principal value range between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Anything else doesn't exist, okay? We know it's there for the rest of the stuff, but as far as returning your value, your value of your angle is always going to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So that's where this becomes negative pi over 3 or negative 60 degrees. Okay? Now, if I have the inverse sine of pi over 2, I am not putting in an angle that is a ratio value. And how do I know? Because a ratio is taken in in an inverse function. So pi over 2 is my ratio. Okay, where is that supposed to be if I'm talking about the fact that I'm looking at pi over 2 is like 1.7? Okay, we all right with what, where, where things are going? Put pi over 2 in your calculator real quick. Okay, it's 1.7. Is that inside, oh, 1.57. Okay, so we got 1.57. It's bigger than 1, right? What will happen if I put that in my sine inverse function? What will happen? Error. Why? What's the domain? It's outside of it. So this is DNE. Okay? Because remember, our domain is between 1 and negative 1. Okay, and that one's outside of it. Now, it's not outside the domain of regular sine. This is the inverse sine. And the largest value you can put in is 1. The smallest value you can put in is negative 1. As soon as it gets outside the domain, it no longer works. That's why we go D and E. Are there questions about it? Are we okay? Yes or no? Yeah. This is your principal value range from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 of sine. This is the only area that you can get numbers out of. And that's what we defined on top uh, uh, previous, on the previous parts of notes. Yeah? How did I know it's what? Sure. Okay. Are you okay with the fact that I'm at negative pi over 2 here and I'm at pi over 2 here because I'm talking about the inverse of sine? Okay. And this is 0. Now, I have a negative square root of 3 over 2, and it's sine, okay? I have, if I'm looking at the unit circle here, negative pi over th and sine, all that negative stuff is down here on the bottom side, below the y-axis. So I have two spots. That sine that we know, you're thinking about the unit circle, is negative square root of 3 over 2. This is outside the range for me to get a value back in, okay? So I have to bring it back inside my principal value range. Well, I do have a value here, okay? And that's why I'm, and if it was a positive unit circle, I would be talking about um, uh, one, two, three, five pi over three. But I kind of fall off the earth. As soon as I go here and I'm I fall off the earth, okay? My only values are between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So I have to know to get down here, I'm going negative pi over 3, okay? Because although I have 5 pi over 3, you know, I'm thinking about it, you know, 6 pi over 3 is my full, I go negative pi over 3 to get there, okay? And that's how I know 
That's where I'm getting to. Does that help? Okay. Now, when I'm talking about the sine of pi over 9, that gives me a ratio. Okay. And I want to make sure you guys recognize I'm taking pi and splitting it up into nine equal parts. This is pi over six. Pi over nine is like right here. Okay. I'm taking that's like 20 degrees, pi over nine. Okay. What I want you to know is that if I go, a sine of pi over nine is this value. Okay. It's a positive value. It's vertical. Okay. And I'm just theoretically talking about what pi over nine could be. Okay, I know it's something smaller than a half. But I put that in, so this is a ratio now. Are you okay that that's a ratio? Inside the green circle, if I put the sine of pi over nine in, it's a ratio that's less than a half. Yes or no? Because I put a ratio into this, and it should return a value between negative pi over two and pi over two, and that should be pi over nine. I'm not making any adjustments because pi over 9 is inside sine's, the sine's principal value range, the inverse sine's, between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. No changes. If I'm looking at 5 pi over 6, keep in mind, 5 pi over 6 is over here. Okay? Are you in agreement? Is 5 pi over 6 inside sine's principal value range, which is right here. So, the purpose of what I'm doing here is this. I know the sine of that is a half. Are you in agreement with the sine of 5 pi over 6 is um, 1 half? That's 5 pi over 6. You okay with that? But if I put this in my calculator, okay, remember, we got to learn how to do it without the calculator. This is a reference angle. Are you in agreement that that is my 5 pi over 6 is a pi over 6 reference angle with the x-axis? My pi over 6 reference angle is here. So my calculator on this problem, because of the nature of the fact that sine has to be between, my what I'm returning has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And this is this where sine's a half, sine's still a half, this will return pi over 6. Are you okay with my answer and my explanation? And now, take your calculator, put in sine inverse, left parenthesis, sine 5 pi over 6, right parenthesis, right parenthesis. It should be pi over 6. It comes out to be like... 0.5 something in your calculator, but it'll be the same value as pi divided by 6, okay, just to check. So we're checking out why it is what it is. Are you okay with that with sine? Now, we've done a lot of heavy work with sine. Let's look at these two. And I'm asking you to use your calculator on this. Go ahead, get after it. Okay, so we're asking, as we step through this, we have pi over 6 from the last one. I just want you to use your calculator on the next one and think about what's happening with this. Now, hopefully you're seeing this, that you're, you know, and be in radian mode, by the way. They're asking you for radian mode here. Okay, um, this next one should be 0.9144. And you got to be thinking, what's that look like in my unit circle? I'll bring this up a little higher so for this one. If I'm talking about unit circle wise, coming around here, I've got negative 0.81. Negative 0.81 is here. But they're saying you're returning a value that's like this. Okay, because that's what my radians is going to be. Because it's a radian measure. Okay, that's how far away from standard position it's going to be. In B, your calculator returns negative 1.5. Right? 
You happy with that? Okay. Um, divide your value that you get from your calculator by pi. What do you get from that? What's the value you get? Did, did you do that, divide it by pi? Negative 0.49. I want to talk about that. You see this 0.49? Okay. Your calculator is thinking about this. And remember, principal value range, pi over 2, negative pi over 2, the pi over 2. Excuse me, I shouldn't put a negative there. It's positive. Okay. Your calculator is thinking, well, you know, I'm going to go around this circle. Ooh, two, three, and I'm here. Okay. 0.49 pi, right? 3.49. Well, remember, over here, I'm outside of the principal value range. Reference angle-wise, I should be here, okay? And it's going to be returning me a negative 0.49 pi as my answer because it's back inside my principal value range. Does it make sense why your calculator gave you 0.49 pi? And you be able to pull this up without even doing your calculator because you know that that brings it inside the principal value range. That's why it's negative. Okay, and that's for sine. Now, we do something very similar for cosine. Okay, when we're looking at cosine, you got your starting high, axis, low, axis, high. Okay, and we're doing something extremely similar for cosine. But you got to keep in mind, for cosine, between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, it's always positive. So we have to include all the values possible on an interval. So we're going to choose an interval between 0 and pi. Okay, between 0 and pi, that'll include all our stuff on the first part of our cosine. And then after that, it starts repeating. Well, when I'm looking at my function here, when I'm talking about my cosine function reflected, I'm going to reflect it this way. Actually, I should be able to get a better picture than that. Okay, and again, this is negative 1 to 1. This is 0 to pi. Okay, so it'll have, that stuff will be included. And where is this on my axis? or on my unit circle, is right here, between 0 and pi. So now I have positive and negative cosine values returned. Okay, that's the principal value range for cosine. Sine and tangent have the same principal value ranges. Cosine's different. Okay, and so we're in quadrants 1 and 2 for cosine. And again, for cosine... We're doing something extremely similar. We got our domain. We got between negative 1 and 1. Our principal value range is between 0 and pi. And I, I would like to make sure that you see that y equals cosine, the inverse. And that's the inverse you learned when you were in geometry. Becomes now arc cosine x. They are the same. Arc cosine x is inverse cosine. And why? you got to keep in mind, the inverse represented the idea that you reflected over the y equal x line. This idea of arc cosine is interjected when we're here in trig because the actual value of cosine raised to the negative 1 power is secant, right? So now, how do we deal with that notation issue? We talk about the inverse cosine as arc cosine, so we don't get that confusion, okay? Now, this idea of the inverse cosine function is the function f of x cosine of negative 1 with the domain negative 1 is 1. Principal value range, make sure you know that. I think that's what you had to write down in that section, is 0 to pi. This means that x represents a cosine ratio of f of x represents a positive angle, either acute or obtuse in either quadrant 1 or 2. They're always working with that angle value. Uh, coming through. So we go 0 to 180 for our cosine or 0 to pi when we're working with cosine. Now being able to get these with what's happening with our cosine.
Now you get the first part. Okay, so now, when's cosine the square root of 2 over 2 be negative? What, what angle value has negative square root of 2 over 2? And we're talking about cosine. And remember, cosine is here to here, 0 to pi. And we're really looking at that, aren't we? 3 pi over 4. Okay, are you okay with that value? And I, we're having you look at this, and we're coming up with the negative square root of 2 over 2, and square root of 2 over 2. This one's sine, that one's cosine. Okay, so we're talking about 3 pi over 4. Okay, now this idea of arc cos is the same as inverse cosine of negative 1 half. So if I'm looking at 1 negative 1 half, when is cosine negative 1 half? You okay with pi over 3? Or 2 pi over 3, excuse me. Pi over 3 is over here. 2 pi over 3. We doing okay? Now, I want you to think about this next one. The cosine of negative 1.1. Oh, yep, chance. Are we talking about B? 5 pi over 6 is down here. Well, we're talking about cosine, not sine. Sine is 5 pi over 6 here. Which two? So this one right here. We're talking about that, and we're talking about cosine. Cosine is the first one. So if I'm talking negative pi over 2, and then I've got negative pi over 2, the square root of 3 over 2 is 2 pi over 3. And pi over 5 pi over 6 is the square root of negative square root of 2 over 3 and 1 half where the one-half would be positive. See, it's working with a negative cosine that goes to the left of the y-axis. Positive signs are on top of the x-axis. You okay with where I'm going with the values? Okay. And those are the ones that are most likely. If you make a mistake on the test, you're going to flip-flop the 5 pi over 6 and the, the pi over 6s and the pi over 3s. Now, in this next one, when I'm talking about it, cosine is an even function, right? Cosine's even. You can put the inverse cosine of cosine to the negative 1.1 into your calculator. It'll spit back out 1.1. Okay. Remember, cosine being negative 1 brings it down here. Okay. It's got to be put back in, so it's 1.1, but it's an even function, so it's going to be up in here. Okay, so that's where that's what will happen. This is a ratio. This is finding that ratio. This is bringing the ratio back, and that's the ratio that we're gonna. That's the angle that we started with. Okay, so ratio of this angle, and this brings back to that angle when we're looking at it. Even if you can put it in your calculator right now, go ahead and try it and, and prove it to yourself for a second. We're looking that over. You doing okay with that? Weird, right? But that's why it does it. Because it's outside the principal value range, and it'll bring it back. But more importantly, you got to be thinking about cosine being an even function. And when there's a negative inside of there, just pull it out. Okay? Now, tangent. Tangent, if we're looking at this. And how did I do this? Well, let's go here. Let's go here. Let's go here. Let's go here. I've got zero here. I got a zero here, I got a zero here, a zero here, and a zero here for tangent. Remember, tangent is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So I've got this negative pi over 2, negative pi over 2, or positive pi over 2. And then I start doing 3 pi over 2. And I've got negative 3 pi over 2 here. And I'm down here at 1. I'm up here at positive 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1 negative 1, this is positive 1 up here. So I have this. Maybe we'll do a different color. 
I have this, I have this coming up here, I have this coming up here, I have this coming up here, and this coming up there. That should have stopped. Okay. And again, your range for tangent, I kind of alluded already, it's going to be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay. And with that said, remember, I'm reflecting just this, just this section over my y equal x line. And what's that do is it gives me this. That's coming up there, yeah. There. Okay, so that's going to be my inverse tangent function with the reflection of between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And this is um, my pi over 2. This is negative pi over 2. I know this is negative 1 and 1, but it really doesn't matter because it's unbounded, it's unrestricted for my domain because it's negative infinity to infinity. My range is from negative pi over 2, and it doesn't equal it to pi over 2. Okay, And again, it's from negative pi over 2 on my unit circle to pi over 2 in this area. Okay, As I'm stepping through that. And that's in quadrants 1 and 4, just like sine is. Okay. Now, so the inverse tangent function has, you know, the domain of negative infinity to infinity. So you can put anything into the inverse tangent function. So you got to be careful about that, okay? And you'll only get out things between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, okay? And this should be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And whose tangent it is x? Now, this is example three, further continued. Um, the tangent, the inverse tangent of the value one, remember, one is sine over cosine, okay? But it's positive. And remember, when we're talking about the unit circle, tangent's positive here, tangent's negative there, okay? So I'm talking about here, this is pi over four, okay? Now, when I'm looking at this, the tangent of the square root of 3. I have the square root of 3 over 2 and this and 1 half. I've got to make a decision. I'm not dividing by the, the square root of 3 over 2. So I've got the square root of 3 over 2 divided by 1 half, which is that, 2 over 1. That gives me this. Okay. So I'm saying the square root of 3 over 2 is sine. When is the sine the square root of 3 over 2? It's in pi over 3. Okay, so and this is positive, so this is at pi over 3 when I'm stepping through that. And then my last one here, I've got the square root of 3, negative square root of 3 over 3. But remember, you'd probably be able to recognize it faster if it was negative 1 over the square root of 3 like that, because I would have my cosine as the square root of 3 over 2. Okay, so cosine of the square root of 3 over 2, that's... Um, working with sine being positive one-half, and we're going to be looking at pi over 6 or negative pi over 6, or pi over 3. No, pi over 6 is good. Negative pi over 6 for that last one. Thank you for your patience. You guys have a great day.